Welcome to another edition of TransLogic. I'm Bradley Hasemeyer. And I'm Caitlin Thompson. In this edition, I head out to the test facility of General Atomics to learn about their maglev train technology. And I'll check out the subculture of folks who love the often criticized but always iconic car that symbolized the 80s like no other, the DeLorean DMC-12. But first, let's check out the news. It's time for the World Report. In news that comes as a bit of a surprise, Tesla and Toyota have announced a plan to work together on the development of electric vehicles. Further, Tesla has bought the new United Motor manufacturing plant from Toyota. The plant, located in Fremont, California, is something of an icon as it was a site of a joint venture between Toyota and GM that dates back to the 80s. Tesla plans to build its new, cheaper Model S at this facility. In turn, Toyota will also be purchasing $50 million in Tesla stock in a private offering after their IPO later this year. This move helps both companies dramatically. See, Toyota, who's had a difficult year to say the least, finally gets a chance to polish its image in America by investing in a bright young company that's also media darling. Tesla gets the backing of the world's largest car company and a little proof to investors that they aren't just a boutique car maker, but a legitimate mass manufacturer. So to put things in perspective, Tesla sold about a thousand roadsters total. Toyota sold almost 28,000 Corollas in the U.S. in April. What? This helps establish Tesla as a major player and not just a passing fad. In the 1980s, no car was more iconic than the DeLorean DMC-12. The car reached almost mythic status as kids dreamed of it being the fastest, most incredible sports car ever built. This was far from the case, but the brand still has its fanatics. I decided to go check out the new DeLorean company to see what it was all about. We're here at the DeLorean Motor Company of California and we're here with Danny. He's gonna tell us a little bit about these cars. Now, Danny, you got all these cars, you got lots of parts, where do they come from? When the company went under back in 1983, we have 9,000 cars that were built, 30,000 cars were supposed to be made. So all those parts that never got used for cars, we own. When we do run out of parts, we make them. How do you do that? We have all the original blueprints and designs for every single part Very on the car. Cool, yeah. We go pull that file on that part, we look at the way the part is, and we look to improve it. So there's some things that you guys have modified. What else have you done? The lower control arms in the rear suspension of a DeLorean were a fixed control arm. Okay. You could never adjust the, the toe and the, the cambers like you should. But we've taken those and we've made them adjust them. We've improved big time on those. So the tires will actually track better, wear better, things like that. So there's all these independent DeLorean company kind of things, right? And then they all merge like a, like a great Voltron, right? To create right. the DeLorean Motor Company. How did that get going? That actually all started with a gentleman by the name of Stephen Wynn. Wynn from like Vegas, the no, hotel? No, different one. Yeah. Different oh, one. Different guy. He bought all the leftover inventory from a company called KPAC, put it all in a big, beautiful warehouse in Texas. Texas, right. Started really bringing the DeLorean name back and really came to all of us, kind of brought us all together to work as one unit. Working together, we bring part, parts prices down for everybody. Yeah. It's easier for the, the owners to get parts and service. Uh, it just, it's really made it us a whole family together. Yeah. He's done an incredible job with that. You can create new build DeLoreans, right? Correct. So explain this concept to me. So we take a donor car, we take it completely apart. We take the steel frame out and put a stainless steel frame in it. We refab the whole underbody. We'll put all brand new panels and, and new engines and new brakes with all the updates, all the newer technology parts, electrical systems, heated seats, you know, a lot of different options too, and even more power if you want to go to our stage two unit. What's that, that's an engine? That's an engine, engine modification okay. upgrade. The stock DeLorean was 130 horsepower. Okay. Back in 81, wasn't bad. 2.8 liter. 2.8 liter. We take the engine out, we put high performance cams, we port and polish the heads, we put a new stainless steel exhaust and header system in the car, boosting it to almost 200 horsepower. So what's the future for DeLorean? Well, right now our future is to continue to improve upon and, and keep making the, the DeLorean the best we can. Working on right now stage three engine, which is gonna be supercharged. I've been asked a lot of times whether or not we're going to do a different, completely different car. Yeah, you're gonna build and a new, like a new, new car. Well, right now, no. The the public loves the original car. And every time we, we have suggested maybe doing something different, different headlights, different taillights, and changing the look, we've kind of got a little flack back on it. People don't want to do it. We probably will change interior, make more modern interiors and dashes and things like that. You know, it is, it's a timeless piece. It's still futuristic today, and now it is a 30-year-old car. 
It's so interesting that the DeLorean still has such a grip on so many people. Why is that? Well, I mean, obviously the Back to the Future movie has a lot to do with it, but it's so much more than that. I mean, it's it's the super unique design. Think about, like, it stands out today, but right. imagine the 80s when that thing would go rolling down the street, right? It had this edgy Italian design. It's got this overall American feel. It's like a, like a Ralph Lauren space shuttle, right? Oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's what people would think when they saw it, you know? And, and think about it, like, the folded cardboard, hard stainless steel exterior, the gull wing doors, mm -hmm. nothing could compete visually with that. And, you know, I think that coupled with the, the Back to the Future has really given this car some mystique that far outweighs its expectations as a performance car or something, which, be, let's be honest, it was not really much of a sports car. Right. Yeah. We'll be seeing more from DeLorean in the coming weeks, including a test drive and a look at what might be the most accurate Back to the Future DeLorean replica in the world. We'll also take a look at the life of John Z. DeLorean and the genius and troubles that defined him. Earlier, I visited the Maglev Research Headquarters for General Atomics, a highly advanced nuclear physics and defense contractor that is now testing out Maglev train technology. Check it out. I'm here at General Atomics with Dr. Sam Garal, and here is the levitation test facility. So tell me, what is General Atomics? General Atomics uh, is uh, into a number of areas. In the defense area, we're best known for the Predator, and more recently, we have the Navy's sole source contract for electromagnetic aircraft launch and recovery. We're involved in fusion power and have on our campus uh, the United States only operating test fusion facility, the Dublin 3. We're involved in uh, both MAGLEV, which stands for Magnetic Levitation Systems, uh, but also involved in uh, linear motors used for transporting both passengers and goods. What's unique about our maglev system is that we use permanent magnets which are arranged in a configuration called a Hallback Array. The polarity of the magnets rotates by 45 degrees in our case from one magnet to the next. It focuses the magnetic field on the track where you get the benefit of the levitation force. The magnetic field on the back side is canceled so that you don't need any shielding materials for the passenger compartment. We're able to achieve a relatively large levitation gap of about one inch. Most maglev systems around the world use much smaller air gap, three-eighths of an inch, which means that they need to have much more accurate guideway structures built. So aside from obvious environmental benefits, how will these trains affect public transportation infrastructure? Well, maglev is an enabling technology, which means it can do a few things very well. Maglev is much faster than conventional transportation. It's also able to climb steep grades up to 10% compared to 3% for conventional rail. What this means for urban planners is that tunneling can be avoided. And tunneling is extremely expensive. It can actually be much cheaper deployed in an urban infrastructure type setting than conventional transportation systems in use today. Do you see an application for these in the U.S. market? Well, I sure hope so. Uh, I believe passionately that these are transformational technologies. They can transform not only the way people move, but also the way goods move. But we're focused on uh, the ports uh, around the country and specifically ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach because the ports are expected to grow significantly in the next several decades. And we believe these technologies allow the ports to do that without adverse effects on the environment. Thanks to GA, we'll be seeing more from them in the upcoming weeks. That's it for TransLogic. I'm Caitlin Thompson. And I'm Bradley Hasmeyer. See ya. Bye.